So let's get in the stocks. So with stocks, we're doing the overview. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about the overview. What is a stock? What is a return on stock? But on stocks, just the most important thing is growth. So the stock market sold off yesterday. Was it a big day or an average day or below average day? If you'd interviewed yesterday, would they be expecting you to talk about the stock market yesterday? And what one word would you have used? Brian had, had the word. So, yeah, but what, what was the E word from yesterday? Yeah, yeah. So it was a Chinese real estate. You know, Chinese debt has been an issue for quite some time. There's a lot of debt in China. Um, and people are worried about it's going to blow up and it's going to cause this major recession around the world. It's strange thinking that China is going to, you know, we always talk if if the U.S. catches a cold, the rest of the world gets gets the flu. Now we're talking about China getting sick and the rest of the world getting really, really, really sick. Um, so their economy is, you know, there's a big debate whether their economy is first or second depending on how you count it and how you measure it. From a wealth standpoint, US is still larger on a per cap, but China, China is a huge economy. It's huge in trades. So what happens if China has some big blow up and President Xi's making people nervous, right? <laughs> He's uh, clamping down on the wealthy. He's clamping down on, y'all heard about what he did with Ant? Is that the armor, that whole thing with Ant and shutting that whole thing? and. Uh, what he's doing with the tech companies and they've sold off and what he's done with gaming. What would y'all do if y'all had the Chinese, what, you can play what? Play games once a week or something? What is One it? One hour on Friday. <laughs> One hour on Friday. Well, what happened to the United States if they did that? Can you imagine President Biden saying, okay, no more gaming. They shut down the, uh, the touring services, which that's kind of strange, isn't it? That tells you something about China versus the United States. All right, no more tutoring, no more learning. You're learning way too much. We're gonna to have to shut this down. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So there's a lot going on with President Xi. The thing that scares me the most with President Xi, which I don't think the world is focused in on, is what he keeps saying about Taiwan. He's, he has said, during my tenure, tenure, Taiwan will be resolved. How does China resolve Taiwan? Is there any good scenario where Taiwan is resolved? No. What happens to semiconductors if Taiwan is resolved? It's going to be a disaster, right? Why isn't the world worried about that? We already have a major semiconductor shortage right now, and that's without China doing anything. So, you know, these are these are big things going on. So the market's reacting, you know, to that one thing. I think there's much bigger things going on that it should be worried about, but it's not. Uh, but it's all about growth. Right. So that's what you got to ask. What does that real estate firm or real estate in China have to do with growth of earnings in the United States? Why did Apple really sell off a bunch yesterday? Why did Tesla sell off a bunch? So anybody had a lot of exposure to China, those stocks really sold off yesterday. Um, so anyway, so that's that's stocks and it makes it really easy for stocks. We don't have DC cuts I, we have, you know, bucks. We're going to talk about bucks, but it all comes down to earnings growth. That's what the real focus is. So just remember that with stocks, current dividend yield, maybe you're going to make an adjustment, 0.5%, 1% added in there for stock buybacks. But the most important thing is, is earnings growth. So when we have a recession, stocks sell off. Why? Because expected earnings growth is declining quite a bit. And then... I showed you a chart to try to prove that to you. And it worked really, really well until, well, it kind of back, came back in the line in 2008. But for the last 30 years, stocks have been much more expensive than that. I gave you a couple of scenarios there. Either the stock market's really overpriced or the stock market has just become much less risky. And so there's just this one-time shift up. Or you have to adjust for stock buybacks, which I did in this chart, which doesn't, it's not enough to resolve, resolve that. So I think it could be all of those. I do think stocks are less risky today than they were back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, we're getting a lot more information. I think expenses is a big part of that. We've talked about that. I mean, it was much more expensive to trade stocks in the 70s than it is today by, by far. Uh, and that by itself, you know, if you're paying 2% in expenses, you got to pick 2% more just to come out 
the same as today where it costs you almost nothing to buy stocks. You can go to Vanguard and buy a stock fund that charges you, you know, 0.2%, two basis points a year. I mean, it's practically free. And they actually make up that two basis points through securities lending. And we'll talk about later. So you essentially get the stock market for free in the United States if you go to Vanguard or BlackRock. So I think expenses is a big part of that as well. But I do think the stock market might be a little bit expensive. And then we said, where does this earnings growth come from? Well, I say it's got to be closely tied to the economy. Corporate earnings are not going to grow 8% if the economy is growing 5%. It's just not possible. So you have to look at the economic growth. And so I gave you this chart that just shows you that our economy has historically grown faster than corporate earnings. That makes some sense. They should be growing the same, but this is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 are big companies. There's a lot of small companies that are making up that growth. If you added that in, you know, corporate earnings. Corporate earnings has traditionally been about 14% of our economy, and it probably will be for a long, long time. Because if corporate earnings gets bigger, something else has to shrink, whether it's consumers or government or import exports, something else has to shrink. And I thought it was amazing. Uh, Dr. Demidaran says corporate earnings growth should equal the 10 year treasury yield. And you can see, he said that several years ago. You can see we're right on that long term corporate growth, earnings growth has been 5.76%. The 10 year treasury yield has been 5.66%. But that would be a disaster today, right? Because 10-year treasury is only 1.3%. If the stock market th thought earnings growth was going to be 1.3%, the stock market would sell off 70, 80%. So I don't know if that, that works going forward. And then this is where we got to last time. So the components, and it was good to repeat all of that because it's a really, really important foundation to have on stocks. So where does economic growth come from? Productivity, labor, and inflation. And inflation is not really growth. It's just you know, it's kind of, it's, it's in there. Corporations do keep up with inflation, which is good, but that's really uh, funny money. You, you want to beat inflation. So productivity historically in the United States has been about 2%. And remember, I would memorize the definition of productivity because it's a fairly easy definition. So all the Federal Reserve does is they say, look at the growth in the economy on a real basis, net of inflation, Compare that growth to the growth and hours worked, and the difference is productivity. So if the economy grows 4% and hours work grows up 3%, then productivity is 1%. It's that simple. It's a really simple number. Now, what's not simple is how does the Fed measure hours worked? And that I can't tell you. Because a lot of us, you know, I was at USA for years working, you know, 70, 80 hours a week but I was paid for 40 hours. I don't know how they count those hours. I was working a lot of hours. Uh, so what did COVID do to productivity? Have y'all read some of these articles? Were we more productive or less productive? What do the numbers actually show? I don't know if y'all have seen those. Yeah, a lot of them say we're more productive, but then they went back and they said, well, we may not be more productive because workers might just be working for free. All that time they sat in the car, driving to work, they essentially gave all that time for free to their employer. So they weren't necessarily more productive. They were just working longer hours and didn't mind because they were home with the kids and the dog and the cat and all that. So, you know, that's, that's an important one. The economist has been writing quite a bit about that. That's a really critical function because you're walking into a workforce where you might be working two days a week from home. I don't know how many, how many of y'all think you can be working five days a week in the office? when you graduate, do you think, Olivia, is, do you, it depends. Uh, I was just talking to one of our students. He just took a job. He's starting next week at JP Morgan. He quit Goldman Sachs. He actually came in and said, hey, Goldman Sachs fired me. I go, what? Go, no, they didn't fire me. I quit and I got a job, better job, JP Morgan. So he's starting there. Um, I thought he, he had it made because Goldman said work from home and he was in San Antonio and he went back to stay with his mom. I think, man, this is great. You're getting paid New York salary and you're staying at home. And he said, yeah, but I signed, signed a lease in New York. So I had to pay the lease. I thought, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> but, um, you know, working from home, I think because he's entry level, he's starting out, they're expecting him to be in the office every day. But it'd be interesting to see. I, I'd be really curious to see. When I was at USA, we, we did not work from home. 
I had Bloomberg anywhere, so I had Bloomberg at home. I could have worked from home and no one would ever have noticed, but we, we didn't work from home back then. USA started shifting after I retired, started shifting to more work from home. But it's really, really critical. What is that gonna, going to do to productivity? And the other question um, that a lot of people are asking is, does the Fed measure productivity correctly? Are they missing something uh, on productivity? And that's, I mean, it's surprising productivity. You look at it, this last decade has been only about 1%. It's been really, really weak. And that's with artificial intelligence and the internet. You know, you would think productivity would have been going off the charts and yet it's been really weak. And some people question. So I gave you all my theory. I think it's because of education, healthcare is such a big part of our economy. And those are very unproductive parts of the economy. And as they grow, especially healthcare, as they grow as a bigger and bigger part of the economy, and they're very labor intensive, we're not seeing the productivity gains. But most, most fields, lawyers, finance, have y'all heard of robo advisors, online advisors that do a lot what financial planners do, more and more is being shifted to, uh, to online type of things. So, you know, you would think we have more productivity. Uh -huh. I read an article, I don't know if it was by the economist, but they said by like 2050, doctors, lawyers, everyone would be switching to kind of a tele format. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, they've been saying that artificial intelligence has some impressive numbers like reading, y'all probably seen them reading the X-rays and those kind of things where it actually does as well as doctors. We'll see, it's hard to predict those, any of y'all, you know, Yang was running for president last time, right? And what was his big thing? Technology is going to put all these people out of work. So we need to have this universal basic income. And that's, and Microsoft president Bill Gates has talked about the same thing. You know, how many jobs are going to be replaced? You as a finance, if you're a finance major, that's one of the fields they say artificial intelligence is going to replace. That's kind of scary. I'm in the field that I'm not sure finance will exist in 15 years. Um, I think it might get completely replaced by decision science, which if you ask me about a master's degree, you'll probably get my bias on that. But whatever you do, you've got to get a variety of things. So management science, decision science, coding, you know, you got to get a bunch of fields, but you know, you've got to make, so what's going to replace you and what skills are you going to have that's kind of, Come, you know, come in and make sure you have some place to work. I don't, do we have any actual science majors in here? I think we do in here. Yeah, actual science, I mean, that's like the perfect career. Uh, they can do any, the guy who took my place was an actuary. There's no way I could have become an actuary at 40. And yet he quit a job as an actuary, became a portfolio manager. There's, you know, so he, why is that? Because actuaries are strong in what? Math. Coding, they know they can do all that. They can work in finance, they can work in accounting, they can work as actuaries, they can work in decision science, they can do all kinds of things. Um, so that's why in investment society, we, we push coding so much. If you don't know Python or SQL or Java or you know some coding, you're probably gonna be in trouble five or 10 years from now. Um, anyway, so that's productivity. What do we expect productivity going to be going forward? That's, that's a big question. Um, I think artificial intelligence, I think driverless cars, autonomous vehicles are going to be a big one. Um, trucking, especially if we have trucks, what would you think if you see an 18 wheeler next to you going 70 miles an hour and there's no driver in the seat? Would that bother you? <laughs> Even if the statistics say that's a lot safer than a driver, does that bother you? You know, it's, it's interesting. So there's a lot of things that could happen. Um, I think even mRNA is a pretty impressive thing, right? They're going to, find cures much faster if they don't all kill us who knows what's going on there but it's it's interesting what's going on in the world labor you know the birth rates are down around the world we're not replacing japan china us europe especially just the world just dying there's a great 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 ted talk out there i do recommend you watch it even though it's a few years old you online, you may not see this. So I'm just going to Google it. But TED Talk, world population. I thought this guy did a great job. And it's, he, he might, there you go, 10 billion. 
So it's this guy right here with the boxes, Hans, Hans, Hans Rosling. I don't know if any of y'all seen that, but he does a real kind of comical, but very eye opening where he projects the world population is going to hit 10 billion and then it's just going to be stable there. That's his argument for why he believes that. Have any of y'all seen this one before? Yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, how old is it though? It's probably 20 years ago now, 10 years ago, but, or maybe Google him and see, well, he says 9 billion. So I guess, um, so he does a good job. He uses these boxes to try to make it, make it come alive. <clears throat> so that's pretty important because labor growth can't, can't exceed population growth. It gets a little tough. So we had women join the workforce in the sixties and seventies. Um, you know, where else are we going to get, you know, we're going to go back to child labor. We're going to start having six year olds work again. You know, where are you going to get these extra workers? It's going to be, it's going to be really, really, really tough. <clears throat> Uh, so that's something you're going to have to deal with is where all these workers can be. Is there going to be as big a problem? Because, I mean, we have immigration. Like, yeah, immigration in the U.S. is... We have, like, chronological visas and, like, higher level stuff and bringing in people. Cool. Yeah, immigration is a big part of this in the U.S. <laughs> Um, Central and South America still have higher population growth than the U.S. So certainly we have a workforce there. Um, the U.S. is still a fairly sought after country, right, for high school laborers. There was a lot of people. When I was at USA, it was uh, the Russian mathematicians. And I got to talk to them and boy, it's cool talking to them. I, I felt like I was like these brainiacs, that just the way they talked, they were saying words I'd never heard before. Not because they were speaking in Russian, they were speaking in English, but they were just very advanced mathematicians. But would you rather be a mathematician in Russia or a mathematician in the United States? I mean, their pay level was much, much, much higher here back at that time. Um, so, yeah, skilled labor is, is definitely an issue, and immigration has got to address that. Um, we'll see. You're, you're living in interesting times. The next 20 years or so is going to be really fascinating. I mean, the question is, will the politicians get it right? <laughs> right? And so you got to make sure you elect the right kind of people. And those issues are really sensitive. So labor is, is a huge issue going forward. You're hoping all the baby boomers retire because you want their jobs. But then if you're working 100 hours a week because there's not enough workers, you know, that's the downside of that. Now, here's my position. And when you get to paper four, you'll have to address this. Could productivity jump back up to two and a half, three percent because of artificial intelligence and all these other things? I think it's possible, but the offset's going to be labor growth is going to be much lower. So if productivity takes off it's going to reduce labor growth because that's tech in the past technology made us more productive. So they didn't really cut back the workforce. So it was factories where the factory worker would go in and they could accomplish 10 times more because they're more productive. Now we're seeing technology starting to replace labor rather than just making labor more productive. Uh, so it's a different thing. And you think about a, a country like China, they're still growing really fast. So where's that coming from? It's coming from productivity. You take a farmer that was using, you know, 1930s, 1940s technology, and you give them a, a deer tractor, their productivity doesn't go up 20%, does it? It goes up like 40,000%. One farmer can do, you know, a whole lot more. So it's massive, but at some point, you've, you've saturated with the technology, you've gone as far as you go. I think in the US, the key is education and healthcare. Can we get technology in those two fields? So I, I love it that Costco and Google and Apple are talking about healthcare. I like seeing people who know how to run business do healthcare uh, and do it well. Huh? In relation to product, excuse me, productivity, um, I took a course over the summer where they showed China made what they call cow Biao villages. So instead of before they were, weren't really doing much, maybe some agriculture, they say all y'all guys are going to make key chains here and one guy is the lead guy mm -hmm. all for amazon and alibaba then this village does this this village does this yeah and they've transformed sounds great for productivity i don't know if i'd want to <laughs> be told where i'm working but yeah i mean it's china is very it's a big part of this no question the philippines vietnam uh japan uh africa 
There are some people saying this century is going to be Africa's century because they've got the young workforce. Um, but there's obviously some political issues there. So that's the next thing we're going to talk about that when we talk about U.S. versus non-U.S. on stocks. It's there's a lot more opportunities because there's a lot of countries out there and you, you're not picking the country that's doing well, you're doing the, picking the country that's improving the most. <laughs> so a disaster that's getting better is better than a great story that's already priced as a great story. So you're trying to find that turnaround and there's well, there's you know a few hundred countries to select from. And then inflation is inflation. So we talked about that. You can measure that from the bond market. Um, I lived through the 70s with really, really high inflation, but we had pretty good productivity in the 70s as well. Um, I, I love this chart because it really does come down to where you think this last bar is, is really what you think stocks are gonna do. And it's productivity and labor are the two most critical ones. Inflation is whatever it is. It's kind of a pass through. Um, and you can make all kinds of scenarios what it's gonna be. Um, now, where does productivity what is it dependent on? I don't know if I have it on this next slide. I think I do. Here it is. So it's a function of innovation. Which country is the most innovative? I think the U.S. still wins. I think Silicon Valley. I think it's kind of humorous when Putin tried to do the Russian Silicon Valley. And it doesn't quite work when, if you're successful, Putin puts you in jail and takes over your country. That doesn't give you a lot of incentive to be productive are innovative, but I think the U.S. still leads in innovation, but where else? Where else would you go for innovation in this world? Education, who has the best education system? Um, what is it, PRISA? Not PRISMA, I can't, is it PISA? Boy, I've already forgotten. I think maybe it is PISA. So PISA, international student, where does the US rank on PISA? <laughs> Do we rank in the top 10? No. no. It's probably, that's the single most important thing is education. Um, there's a great book I'd, re I'd recommend. It's maybe a little politically sensitive, but I don't care. Um, his, he's pretty well researched, but it's called The Case Against Education. Um, here's the 2018 results. Now, I don't know what COVID has done because there's some countries in the U.S. saying, just give everybody an A because we're, we can't figure this out. That's kind of a scary thing. Um, so I don't, is it somewhere? Do I, there's a place I can hit it. I don't know what the snapshot is. Wow, there you go. <laughs> you can really see that. Sorry, the guy's on, on the computer. Let me stop sharing. Maybe I can share it. So number one is a lot of Asian countries. Singapore, Hong Kong, China. Uh, then you get some of the European, you know, the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Ireland, Korea. Poland, Sweden, uh, and there's, there's the United States on reading. So not quite the top 10. Uh, US, I don't know how the US does well on science. My science in my high school is just really, really bad, but maybe that was just my, my particular experience. Um, so, why does the U.S. rank so low? Why hasn't it gotten any better? You can have all kinds of debates on that. Um, it's public education, private. It's, um, you know, we're charter schools and everything going on in these debates. It's been pretty interesting. Um, but I think this is pretty critical in the U.S. When I was in high school, I had one-fifth of my, my teachers were grossly underpaid. They were incredible. My best teacher was my high school English teacher. Whoa, she was good. But she also worked a lot of hours grading our papers. She was really good. She should have been paid five times what she was paid. And then about 40% of my teachers were, you know, I would have been better off if we just went outside and played because it was a complete waste of time. No preparation, no teaching. Um, 
how do you handle that? How do you change the incentives? You know, that's that's the thing. How do you get teachers to do better? So it's you know, that's that's a big part. There's a lot of people talking about education reform, you know, say it's what actually works. What are Scandinavian countries doing? You've probably seen the articles about how was it Sweden or Norway? They don't have any homework. They don't believe in homework, and yet they rank really, really high. Well, you know, that's interesting. What exactly are they doing? Singapore ranks really high until they come to college, and then their colleges rank really low. So is that good? Is that how you do it? You kill yourself getting to the best colleges, and then you vacation for four years in college. Is that the really the right answer? Who knows? Where are the best universities in the world? And then okay. US, UK, yeah. China's catching up, but still has some issues there. Yeah. It's... So you as a stock investor, I would say what countries are most innovative, which countries have the best educational system, because we're going to see when you look at stocks, it's not the growth next year or in two years or in three years. It's the growth in the next 40, 50, 60 years. And these are the big things that you've got to, you got to look at. So is the piece of scores that they tell you enough or are, are they even measured correctly? There was this interesting study. I forget where this, I think I read it in The Economist, but they tried this thing where they would, they would pay students if they did better on the, on the standardized test. And in China and a few other countries, it had no impact at all. And the United States had a huge impact. And what they said is, hey, in the US, if you want students to do well, you need to incentivize them. They can actually do pretty well on exams, but they're like, this is a waste of my time and they don't care. Whereas in some countries, boy, you better do well on this exam or your whole life is, is over. I had one student here from China. He was an only child. I think his family put everything on him to come to the United States to school. If he failed, not only did he fail, but his whole family goes under. That kid was so stressed out. Exceptional student. Everything he did was just off, off the charts. And I was like, just settle down, settle down. We're like, no, 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 I got it. You know, that's a lot of pressure to put on a poor kid. Uh, and that was the pressure he felt. And then I had other students that was like, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna come to class. Yeah, I don't, yeah, but D's good enough. And it's like, wow, the contrast in those two people. Um, so, you know, so, some of it might be that is US students could do just as well if we just change the incentives and the importance Government re regulations is important. Immigration is, is important. Um, you know, those are the kind of strategies you're looking at country by country by country. And you're trying to find those countries that either are really good at these or are really bad at these, but they're starting to change to improve them. So I think US economy can grow in the four to 6% range. You'll see that when you get the paper four. You know, if you're below 4%, you're going to have a tough time making an argument to buy stocks. That's a really low growth rate. If you're above 6%, then you need to really argue where's that extra growth coming from. Probably something you're believing about productivity. But historically, productivity in US, 2% has been about the number, and it's not as strong today. And people say, well, but today we got all this stuff, AI, internet. Well, is AI internet as important to productivity as the US getting electricity for the first time, getting air conditioning for the first time, and getting cars for the first time, and highway systems? I mean, we got some pretty important things in the past. <laughs> How long, well, we, y'all saw it this last March, right? How long can you go without electricity? What, what did y'all do when the electricity went out? I guess probably y'all had electricity, but I had no electricity for five days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sat in my car with it. With the heat the running, <laughs> yeah, it's you go find some place that has electricity. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's we're we're hopeless, aren't we, with electricity? We can't do anything, and yet, you know, we haven't had electricity that that long in the U.S. So that kind of productivity is, you know, can we really replicate that type of productivity gain? So, you as a stock investor, you have to have these long-term views. And you have to know it almost country by country by country to really understand as an investor what's going on. All right, so that's the stock. It's dividend yield plus earnings growth. Um, wait, which bit? Which bit? Fox in this building. Three oh three. All right. So stocks. We're going to break stocks into four subcategories. 
I use the word bucks, B-U-C-S, beta, U.S. versus non-U.S., capitalization and, and style. I'm not going to do in that order. I'm going to do B-C-S-U. I don't know what that spells, but bucks. But uh, So I'm going to start with the U.S. The U.S. we break up with beta, capitalization and style, and then we'll do U.S. versus non-U.S., which you can always also break up non-US stocks as beta capitalization and styles. So you don't have to just stick with US versus non-US as one category. So the B is I'm using the word beta in a more generic terms. So I know beta is part of the capital asset pricing model. We'll see it That's a calculation, it's a statistic. That's not what I mean here. So what I mean by beta, well, somewhat, but what I mean here is the type of company it is. So you don't need a number. I don't need a beta as a number, but I need a beta in terms of what kind of company is this, all right? So there's two types of companies and you're reading. Anybody remember the two types of companies? Cyclical and defensive. So if a company had a beta of 1.6, what kind of company would it be? Cyclical or defensive? Cyclical. What kind of company might have a 1.6 beta? Yeah, Boeing or Ford or... All right, what about a 0.6 beta? It's gonna be defensive, we might have a 0.6. Walmart, Walmart, that's a little low for Walmart, but it's somewhere in that Walmart, kind of in that category. Although Walmart's beta has been really low here this last few years. But our grocery store, discount store, um, utilities, low beta. So when we talk about beta, we're asking how sensitive is this stock or this company to the overall economy? And the way I think about it, if we go into recession, would this firm's revenue fall more than the average firm or less than the average firm? If it's a cyclical firm, its revenue is gonna be hit really hard in the recession. If it's a defensive firm, its revenues won't drop, maybe not drop at all during the recession. So you have cyclical stocks that have high betas, things in retail, retail, what we call consumer discretionary. Consumer discretionary, those are things that consumers can skip if they're worried about losing their job. So I put Nordstrom's in there, I probably should put Macy's in there because Macy's is really struggling. But Nordstrom, durable goods like cars, heavy equipment, planes like Boeing, Commodities, uh, steel companies, they tend to be very sensitive to the economy. Uh, travel and leisure, obviously, very, very sensitive. So those things that people, you know, someone says, hey, I'm worried about losing my job. I was thinking about buying a new car, but I better wait. Yeah, it's, their revenues are gonna fall. We certainly saw that last year with Carnival Cruise Line, United Airlines, when you see revenues drop 80%, which is completely unheard of. We've never seen that in history, but that's obviously very, very sensitive to the economy. Um, now we usually, we used to, during my career, think of technology as high beta, but how did tech do last year? Kind of loved it, right? So it's hard to always say that tech is becoming less high beta than it used to be in the past. Um, mainly because I, I, I think some people would, would give up on HEB before they gave up on their smartphone. It's become a really part, some people think of Apple as almost a utility where you have to buy, you have to have their stuff because you just can't survive without it. Low beta, the department stores like a Walmart, like a Costco, like a family dollar, those tend to be low, low beta for a couple of reasons. First, they sell stuff we need all the time. But secondly, they're low cost. So if you're trying to save money, you stop going to Nordstrom's and you go to Walmart. I remember I was at a conference full once and I was freezing. So I went, there's a Nordstrom's, we're in a mall, near a mall. So I run to the Nordstrom's and buy a sweater. The cheapest sweater is like in today's dollars, probably over a thousand dollars. And I'm like, I don't want to buy a thousand dollar sweater. So finally, I, I, fortunately, I found the gap and they had a cheap sweater, but it's like a thousand dollars. I'm not going to buy it. Even in good times when I'm, my pay is good, I'm not going to spend a thousand dollars on a sweater. Um, so 
not only do they provide you know, more basic goods, but they also are much cheaper. Gasoline and food. Why does the Federal Reserve measure inflation X gas and food or energy and food? Well, because they themselves tend to be deflationary. If gas prices go up and food prices go up, people cut back on everything else but those two things because they have to buy them. And so they're, they're pretty central. We buy gasoline or food um, no matter what. I don't know what, you know, grocery spending this last year and fair, you probably saw this at HEB. My personal restaurant expenditures, I used to spend, you know, I looked at the chain. I mean, it's massive, the shift from restaurants to HEB this last 12 months. Um, so how much of that is going to continue? Is that already shifting back? I don't know if grocery stores are noticing the shift back, but yeah, it was, that was a pretty almost overnight. My first time to send an HEB line for two hours with a cart. Uh, as they're letting just a few people in because they're running out of food, pretty crazy stuff. Um, so food is, is pretty basic to what we're doing. Other consumer staples, utilities. Telecom historically has been a low beta. That may be changing somewhat. Um, and in healthcare, healthcare is not always a low beta. It can depend on the type of healthcare. We generally think, you know, if you break your leg, you know, I can say, well, I broke my leg. I'm going to worry about losing my job. I'll wait to get it fixed. You know, you're probably going to get it fixed. But the biggest thing with healthcare is who pays for it. Most healthcare are paid for what, by whom? U.S. government or private health insurance. So you don't, U.S. consumer don't actually even pay for it. However, what happens when you go into a recession? People lose their job. What else do they lose? They lose their healthcare. So there is some relationship there. So healthcare is a little bit, a little bit tricky. And in between, I put technology in between. There may be some others that might be a little bit in between. And sometimes they can get a little tricky. So I was listening to Dr. Demidera and he was talking about Ferrari. Ferrari produces cars. Is that a high beta or low beta? You would think high beta. What does Dr. Demidera say? Why would that be low beta? No, not, you don't have to have a Ferrari though. Who buys Ferraris? Yeah, billionaires. The billionaires worry about recessions. The billionaires go, oh, I worry about a recession. I'm going to lose my job. My net worth is $50 billion. It's going to drop to $40 billion. We're going to have to cut back. Uh, probably not. Right? A $500,000 car to a billionaire is like, who cares? It's, you just don't even notice it. So he actually argues that Ferrari is a low beta stock because the clientele is so wealthy, it doesn't matter. So, so maybe so. Um, so it's not always obvious. You're going to see when we do paper three, and I'm going to, my process, the other professors are like, Ron, why do you do that? That's so bizarre. But I'm going to argue why I think my process makes sense. Those that took 3013, you remember the rolling beta? So you're going to have to do that again in this class. I, I really think it's important. Um, we can look at um, Walmart and see what its beta is, it's been negative. I don't believe Walmart is a negative beta stock. I think it's definitely a 0 0.6, 0 0.7 beta stock, but this last year it's did so well under COVID that its beta went, went negative. <clears throat> I'm sorry, our internet is so ridiculously slow in this school. Yeah, it just, it just oh. I know it's possible. That, I know their argument is all these students are using the internet at the same time. I worked at USA where you had 40,000 employees all using the internet at the same time. And someone would be fired if we had this, <laughs> this speed of internet at USA. So somehow USA can do it, but, but uh, UTSA cannot. All right, so their beta is coming back up, 0.48, but it was negative last year. So you have to remember the beta that's here is a mathematical calculation. It's the last five years monthly, so it's very, very sensitive. So I'll make you do a longer term to look at it. Uh, we'll do it the way you did it in your other classes. I don't like that approach because it, to me, you need to see beta over time. It varies a very sensitive number. 
If you use a 0.48 beta for Walmart, you'd be buying a lot of Walmart stock right now. Their stock would look really, really cheap. You'd be valuing Walmart probably at $300, $250. That's a very low beta used for Walmart. So I doubt that would be the right, right number to use. Uh, wow, the stock market went negative after being up. All right. All right, so that's the definition of beta. We're looking at cyclical stocks and defensive stocks. Here's my high level of what I think about the market. Energy stocks can be low to kind of medium. It kind of depends, but we tend to buy gasoline no matter what. But we do know when there's a recession, people drive less because they don't have to go to work. Obviously, COVID had a huge impact on gas prices. I forget how low they got. Did they get yeah, below two bucks last year, didn't they? I mean, it just really dropped because no one was driving. Um, so, but COVID is unusual. It hit certain industries a whole lot more than normal. Material is always, materials are always a high beta stock with one big exception, and that's gold. You know, gold, people that produce gold, gold is a defensive uh, material. Industrials, just by definition, that's going to be high beta. If you're producing massive infrastructure type of things. Communication services is a brand new industry. That's where they stuck Google and Facebook and all the telecoms. So the telecoms moved in their own category. So they gave them their own, their own category. Um, is that high beta or low beta? That's, you know, you think advertising, you would think that'd be high beta that firms would cut back, but it could be lower beta. Mainly, I put it lower in there because the telecoms are in there, so they're traditionally lower beta. Consumers, discretionary, and staples are just by definition high and low beta. That's the definition of discretionary and staple. Healthcare, kind of in between. Financials, financials are somewhat interesting. You would think they'd be high beta because you would think, you know, they have bad debt expense during the recession. They're very sensitive to interest rates, but they're also a spread business. So they tend to be a little bit more stable than you might think. But um, now in 2008, what did the betas on financials do in 2008? They shut off the two and a half, three, because they were right in the middle of the storm. What did the betas for technologies do in 2000, 2001? They shot up because they're in the middle of the storm. So betas are very sensitive to the environment. Uh, information technology, we tend to think higher. Real estate, we tend to think being higher our beta, but there, there is some real estate that's a little more defensive. And then utilities is traditional, very low beta. So it, it, it kind of depends. Um, I've seen, uh, I remember seeing Ford had a beta of like 0.6 in Yahoo Finance. I would never use a 0.6 beta for Ford. So you gotta be really careful when you use Yahoo Finance to get your beta. We'll talk about that more later in the class. Uh, these totals, I forget when I got them. Uh, what's interesting here is technology is 27%, but it's really more than that because Google and Facebook used to be technology and they're now computer. So technology is like 35, 40%. Historically, anytime a sector got above 30%, it crashed really fast. Energy, financials, technology. So there's, we're in a point right now with, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, you got a few companies that are, you know, $2 trillion, $1 trillion companies that are really dominating the market. Like we've never, I've seen some studies that go back to the 20s, 30s, and 40s. It's hard to find a period of time where just a few companies are so dominating the stock market. It really is pretty unusual. Um, so it's, it's a scary time. But the nice thing about these companies, as expensive as they are, they also have incredibly good earnings. These are incredibly profitable firms. So it's not, it's not like, like back in 2000 when you had these firms with no earnings trading these high, high, high expensive stock prices. These are companies that are very expensive, but they're also extremely profitable. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see what impact they have going forward. All right, so what do you do with this? Pretty straightforward. You're expecting a recession. You wanna increase your beta or reduce your beta? Y'all should know this from 3013. 
your boss says, hey, expect a recession, you'll say, well, therefore, we should do what to remain of our portfolio. You want to reduce it. How do you reduce the beta portfolio? Real simple. You sell high beta stocks and you buy low beta stocks. You sell Ford and you buy Walmart. It's really simple. Now, don't get confused here when we talk about value and growth. Value and growth and defensive and cyclical are not overlapping. Okay, so we really, some students get really confused. They think defensive stocks are value stocks and cyclical stocks are growth stocks, but that is not the case, all right? So be real careful. If you're expecting a really strong economy going forward, get those high beta stocks. What did Carnival Cruise Line stock do last year when they announced the vaccine was ready? What do you think it did? Shut up, right? I was looking at Pfizer stock. Pfizer stock shot up, shot up, and then I said, oh, Carnival Cruise, this stock shot up even more. I don't know how many of y'all want to go on a cruise. To me, it wasn't the pandemic. It was, uh, y'all saw those stories, people get stuck in the ocean with no bathrooms, no running water, stuck out there for weeks. And it's like, that's a lot worse than a pandemic to me, boy. But people are still wanting to do cruise and they've come back somehow. But really, really, very, very straightforward. Now, there is two things you got to, well, a couple of things you have to think about here. When we talk about reducing beta, we mean it in two ways. One way is you take your stock portfolio and you sell high beta stocks and buy low beta stocks. But the other thing you do is you actually reduce your stocks overall. All right. So you move out of stocks into bonds. So we're talking about beta. That's where you put that discussion. So if your boss say, hey, we're expecting a recession next year. OK, I want to reduce my stock portfolio. What do you want to do with bonds? We've already talked about that. With bonds, you want to move into what? Higher quality, what do you want to do with duration? Length and duration, higher quality, length and duration. So get out of stocks, reduce your overall stocks, move into higher quality bonds, lengthen out duration because we expect rates to fall. And then within stocks, so reduce our stocks, but the stocks we have left, we want to reduce the beta, all right? So you got all these moving parts. So if you get that question in an interview, so, hey, what if I were expecting recession next year, what, what should I do? Okay, well, reduce your stock allocation, reduce the beta of your remaining stock portfolio, move into higher quality, longer duration bonds. That would be a very astute answer. What percentage of finance students would give that answer? It's probably less than 50%. The graduating finance students would give something so basic to finance, such a basic answer, um, that's why they like to ask that question in interviews. Because you've had all that, finance students have had all that stuff, but when they're asked the direct question, I remember interviewing one of my students and I asked them that question and we covered it in class like 20 times and he didn't know the answer. I was like, ah, how can you not know the answer? And I was, he could tell the one way I was looking at him that I was really upset that he did not know the answer to that question. He was a really good student too. He did really well. For some reason, it just didn't click. So, all right, any questions on beta? I'm using the word beta, talking about your exposure to, to stocks overall and then within stocks, how sensitive those stocks are that you have. All right, so I'm, I'm skipping the U and going to the C, so I'm all in the US. The second one is capitalization. So in capitalization, so with, with beta, we have cyclical and defensive. For capitalization, we have large cap, medium cap, small cap, micro cap, and penny stocks, all right? A bunch of categories. The main ones though are large, mid, and small. Those are the main key stocks. Now the parentheses, it changes all the time. So I say large cap is greater than 20 billion. That may not be true today. Mid cap might be 40 billion today. So it's, it's hard to say, it moves with the markets, right? If our market sold off 50%, our definition of large, mid and small will change. So don't memorize those numbers. I'm just saying kind of in the ballpark. Definitely a $200 billion firm is a large cap. Definitely a $5 billion firm is a mid cap, maybe small cap. So it's a little questionable. Mid cap, small cap, a hundred million to me, that's a pretty small company. You got a hundred million dollar company Better be really careful what they're doing. That's a firm that could really go out of business. Two billion, 
you know, that's, that's a good size firm. There's a lot of $2 billion firms that would be household names that you would have heard of before. Microcap, probably a firm that's just went public, a small firm that just, you know, did a, their initial public offering. What's a penny stock? Penny stock is a firm that's what? Like a startup. Probably going out of business, <laughs> right? Probably going out of business. That's why it's you know, a 25 cent stock probably going to go out of business. We own one of those in the portfolio. Unfortunately, someone recommended a stock that just crashed. It was on our books for 18 cents, 17 cents, 32 cents, 14 cents. And finally, they just wrote it off. My broker just knocked it completely out. Not worth anything. Like, okay. I kept it. I kept it only because some rare chance someone bought them out. It might jump up to three or four bucks. You know, most I'm going to lose is you know, like $20. <laughs> But I could, you know, so to me, I was just like, who cares? 20 bucks, something happens, maybe they'll get bought out. But those are penny stocks. People talk about penny stocks all the time because you can make a fortune on penny stocks. If you bought GM before they went out, the stock was worthless, but it jumped around 40 cents, 80 cents, 70 cents. You could have bought it at 40 and sold it at 80, but it wasn't worth anything. It was worthless. So why did it jump from 40 cents to 80 cents? Well, because someone sorted GM stock and they made a fortune and they wanted to close it down. So they were closing their sale and that caused the stock price to go from 40 cents to 80 cents. They were just shutting down their short sale, but it wasn't because GM was worth it. And I know people do penny stocks, boy, it's, you're buying something that 99% of the time it's gonna go to zero, but you're hoping on the way the zero just bounces around. You can just catch it on the bottom of the bounce versus the top of the bounce. Um, now these, these different stock classes, they tend to be highly correlated to each other. So you're not getting much diversification benefit. When large cap fall 30%, small caps probably falling 35, 40%. They're, they're all pretty well related. So the, the key comes with the expected return, expected risk. Small cap have a higher expected return, higher risk. So when would you want to buy small cap in a strong economy? Small cap do better in, in strong economies. Large cap do better in weak economies. Now, that's not always the case because of what's going on with those large tech companies. But long term, that is the case. Now, the long, long, long term, small cap have done exceedingly well, so much that there's a lot of PhD papers asking, why does small cap do so much better than their risk? They make much more relative to the risk than they're supposed to if the markets are efficient. That somewhat has died the last few years because the big tech companies have done so well. But historically, small cap had had really, really good returns with higher risk, but not so much higher. So pretty straightforward. If you're expecting a recession, reduce your small cap, increase your large cap. So this is where it gets complicated on the second exam question. Your boss is expecting a recession. So you're going to reduce your stocks overall. You're going to reduce your beta of your stocks. You're going to buy more high quality bonds linked in duration. However, within stocks, while you may reduce your large cap, you won't reduce them as much as reduce your small caps. So within stocks, you're probably going to over allocate the large cap. So you may still reduce your large cap, but you don't reduce them that much. Okay. So, so that's really, get this in your notes. When you're talking about stocks, if you're expecting recession, you have to say within stocks, so I'm gonna reduce stocks overall, but within stocks, I'm gonna have a higher allocation to large cap and a lower allocation to small cap, okay, relative to each other, All right? So that phrase within stocks is important. Now, if you're expecting a strong economy, you're gonna increase your stocks overall, and then you're gonna really increase your small cap. So there you don't have to really say within stocks because you're just increasing it. <laughs> Now you can go back and test this. We did this a lot at USA. I have not done this in a while, but actually go back and look at recessions and see how often do small cap underperform in recessions? How often do large cap under, underperform in strength, strong economies? It's not 100%, but small companies, one of the problems small companies have is they tend to rely more on bank debt and bank debt is not that liquid. And so when things get weak, banks don't lend, small companies can't, can't get access to debt. They tend to be lower quality companies. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, you would expect more small companies to go under during a recession. 
So here, here's the actual performance the last few years. So here you can see the last few years, small cap has actually underperformed large cap. Um, and this has been in a pretty strong economic environment other than COVID last year. So this is a time where small cap recently have not done as well as you would historically have thought they would. And that's because of the Apples and the, the Amazons, you know, the big, big, big companies are just really doing well in this environment. You can see though that they, they, had, they did bounce back a lot better out of COVID than large cap did. But here recently, they've just gone sideways. It's, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> they look, this is my point of they look almost identical, don't they? They're not, from a risk standpoint, they just they tend to just move together. So small cap um, has been fairly consistent with large cap until here just recently. This is one of the reasons why I've been over allocating the small cap. It didn't work well today. Small cap's not doing well today um, or yesterday. Small cap was down quite a bit yesterday, but. I, I do think versus their earnings, they're just they're under underappreciated. All right, any questions on capitalization? What's the largest stock out there today? Um, it's Berkshire Hathaway or no? No, not Berkshire Hathaway. No, they're big, but they're not. And I don't consider Berkshire Hathaway to be a stock. I consider them the mutual fund run by Warren Buffett. So I don't even consider them one, but I would say Apple probably is still is. Any company has more than $2.4 trillion market cap. That's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Who might be number two? Um, Amazon or Microsoft. Let's see what Microsoft is. Microsoft's 2.2. .2. Amazon's 1.7. I don't think Facebook is that big. They're right at a trillion. Tesla got, got up there, right? And then they've, they've fallen down quite a bit. Uh, I think Tesla's overpriced, but 740 billion for our firm that produces very few cars relative. I mean, they're bigger than Ford, GM, Toyota, all the, they're bigger than them all combined. And yet they sell a fraction of the cars of any of them. So it's a pretty amazing thing. Anybody else over a trillion? Um, you said Berkshire Hathaway. I don't know what Berk I never look at Berkshire Hathaway because it's insane. Six hundred billion. Yeah, you know Berkshire Hathaway is. Which is the other one where it's like a thirty thousand dollar stock from Berkshire? Well, it's a big stock price. Um, so, but that's I'm talking about market caps. So this is something different. So the stock price is high, but. The stock price and capitalization, I'm, I'm glad you had brought that up, Anthony. Um, stock price is the stock price. Capitalization is what? The stock price times the number of stocks outstanding. So it's the value of the corporation, all right? Just because the stock price is high doesn't mean the capitalization is high. Now, what would happen to the market cap of Berkshire Hathaway if they did a two for one stock split tomorrow? They did a two for one stock split, their stock price would fall in half what, what would happen to your capitalization? Stay the same, right? Their stock price would be $206,000, but they'd have twice as many shares outstanding to be the same valuation. So the stock price, and Apple's done a lot of stock splits over time, right? They just split, 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 split. But the capitalization is what I'm talking about. So it's not the stock price. So when someone says, well, Berkshire Hathaway is an expensive stock, do you mean expensive because it's just high price? It is a high price stock. But expensive to me means it's overvalued. I don't know if Berkshire Hathaway is overvalued or not. It is an expensive stock. That's why they came up with the B shares, right? So that that you know people, there's still an expensive stock, 273, but it's not quite so bad. Um, now, GE used to be the biggest company in the world. Are they the biggest company in the world now? 100 billion, still a big company. Sears used to be the biggest retailer in the world. What is their market cap? 21 million? Yeah, what's the last time y'all were in a Sears store? Has anyone in here never been in a Sears store their entire life? A few of y'all, yeah, that would have been unheard of. Now, when I was a kid, Kmart was a big retailer. They're the biggest in the world. 
and everybody loved the blue light special. I don't know if y'all have ever been in any of y'all never been in a Kmart before, but they were the big thing. And I remember driving home from UT Austin and they announced on the news that Sears just overtook Kmart as the largest retailer. And I go, no way. Someone's bigger than Kmart. There's no way. No one was talking about Walmart and Sears was getting article after article written about what the, they were the greatest retail out there. They had it figured out. They knew how they understood their customers. They also owned a company called uh, Allstate. Have you ever heard of them? They spun them off. Sears is worth 21 million. Allstate's worth 38 billion. <laughs> so they spun off a company. They also owned a company called Discover. That's 36 billion. So. Sears spun off two companies that are now worth 70 something billion and Sears worth 21 million. That's how the world changes over time. So when I was in college, people were talking about Sears being the greatest company in the world, the great retailer. Here we are, what, 30 years later and they're going out of business. Uh, the world, 30 years is nothing in the stock side. So everybody's talking about Amazon being the greatest company in the world. What will Amazon be in 30 years? They might be zero or they might be 80 trillion. Who knows? Apple, you know, so it's, this is the challenge with stock market. If you're going to figure out the value of Google, you, you don't go out 20 years. You got to go out like 150 years to get 70% of your evaluation. And that's really hard to do. <laughs> it's really, really hard to, to guess. You know, Block Rucker Buster looked great right when we knew they were going out of business. Right when Netflix was starting to take over the business, their stock was sitting there high, their earnings were great. And if you look, that was right at the time where everybody said, well, that was the obvious time when Netflix was going to take them out, but no one was talking about that. So being a stock investor is very, very, very difficult. Um, um, JC Penny, I don't know if they're even. Um, if we can even look at them, it's not letting me. Um, Toys R Us went out, Radio Shack, you know, there's firms that at some point, well, Circuit City, Circuit City was listed as one of the best run firms. Uh, it was, in, you know, there's, is it Business Week or Fortune or someone that talks about the best companies out there? You go back and look at those lists 10 years ago, and it's really shocking how horribly horrible some of those firms have done since being on that list. I love that. As a consumer, I want Amazon to go out of business. I want someone to come in that's better than Amazon and take them out. I think that's, I love it when people are fighting over my business, all right? I love it that Walmart and HB are trying to get me to come into their store. It's like, do your best. What do you got? Bring it, bring it on. What do you got? Give me coupons, put nice music going, whatever you got, I'll take it. You know, I, I love that. Restaurant Discovery Zone, it's called Discovery Zone. No, I don't remember them. Chuck E. Cheese almost. Oh, no. Is Chuck E. Cheese still in business? It is. I, I don't go to places that cater to children. <laughs> uh, what is it? Jason's has their kids eat free night. And I was like, okay, memorize Tuesdays. Do not go to, because, yeah, I'm not a kid person. All right. The next one is style. I used not to do style, but style has gotten pretty important. And it's still out there. Some people do not believe style is a thing. And I really recommend listen to some of Cliff Asness's um, YouTubes and blog podcasts. Uh, he's an expert on this. So what is style? So we have two. So remember, with beta, we had defensive and cyclical. With capitalization, large, mid, small. But with style, we have just two, growth and value. And some students get cyclical and growth and value and defensive mixed up. But that's, that's not what they are. And I don't like the word value because value, well, let me ask you, one of these groups is high quality and one of these is low quality. Which do you think is the high quality, which is low quality? What is value? Is that high quality or low quality? You would think it's high quality because it's value, but that's actually low quality, all right? So I would have come up with another, I would have said expensive and cheap or something, but what we mean with growth and value stocks is growth stocks are the expensive companies. 
They're trading at high price to earnings or high price to book ratios. So you're paying a lot for them. Why do we call them growth stocks? Where it's just the assumption that the reason Amazon is trading so expensive is because we expect it to grow fast. So that's where we do a quick, quick growth from that. Value stocks are those that are trading cheap. They're inexpensive stocks. Why are they cheap? Because they're, they're doing horrible things. They've got a lot of debt. They're losing money. So Macy's, Macy's is a value stock today. I don't even know if I can show you Macy's. We'll see. They even, there they are. I probably can't, well, their PE ratio has actually improved quite a bit, but their PE ratio is at 13. That's a really low PE ratio in this environment. That's a pretty low, you know, 13, $13. Compare that to Amazon. Amazon's is 58. So with Macy's, you're paying $13 for $1 earnings. I think I remember Tesla getting up to like seven or eight hundred. Well, yeah, if they had positive, when they finally had positive earnings. If you don't have positive earnings, you can't even calculate it. Why would you spend $58 for $1 of earnings at Amazon and only $13 at Macy's? What's the market telling you? Amazon's going to grow fast. Macy's is cheap because they're going to go out of business. Okay. When's the last time you're out of Macy's? It's been a while, right? So um, expensive stuff. It looks good, right? It impresses people you buy there, but do you really have to do that, especially with the internet now? Um, so you have growth stocks and value stocks. So growth stocks are expensive, but they're also very high quality companies. They tend not to have a lot of debt. They tend to have very strong earnings, good returns. Value stocks like, like a, a Penny's or a Sears, or a Macy's. They're cheap. Why? They're cheap because they're in a lot of trouble. They got too much debt. Their earnings are falling. So don't associate the word value with quality. Value stocks are lower quality companies. Growth stocks are higher quality companies. That's extremely important because if I tell you a value stock is low quality, it's got a lot of debt, is struggling, what are you going to do with value stocks if you're expecting a recession, do you think? You're going to avoid them very carefully, right? You want to, what's Sears going to do if we go into a recession next year? That's probably the end of them, right? They won't be able to survive that. How's Macy's going to ha handle another recession? Probably the end of them, probably take them out. So if you're expecting a recession, you do not want value stocks, you want growth stocks. If you're expecting a strong economy, that's where value stocks would do well. A lot of value stocks, their price to go out of business but then you get a strong economy and that saves them and they come back and you get this huge, huge bounce back on the stock. And it's, you know, it's, it's what you want to do. Now, I was actually surprised. I ran these numbers when I was at USAA and I was actually expecting value stocks to do better in a recession and growth stocks to do better. And I found the exact opposite. And then as I thought about it, well, value stocks are very, they're cheap because something bad has happened. And so if something else bad happens, like a recession, they're going to, they're going to go under. Um, now, there's one other thing. We'll probably start with this next time, and it's with interest rates. Now, this one, I probably should go back and retest it. But value stocks also tend to do better when interest rates rise. And growth stocks tend to do better when rates fall. And that's not 100%. But if you think about it, I just mentioned Google, Amazon. So much of their valuation is 50, 100 years out. So let's see how let's see how we have a genius in the class. What could you describe a growth stock? Something that we use under DC cuts eye. What term could you pull from that to describe growth stocks versus value stocks? Growth stocks have higher what? Higher implied. Go through your DC cuts eye. There's only one of them that fits. Not credit. Well, credit is true. They're higher credit quality, but that's not what I'm thinking about. Interest. We're talking about interest rates. Growth stocks do better, interest rates fall. So that means growth stocks have implied higher what? Duration. Growth stocks tend to be longer duration. Why? Because so much of their valuation is way, way, way out in the future. Value stocks tend to be short duration. Why? Because all their valuations in the next few years. We don't expect them to be around in 10 years. So think of growth stocks as high quality, long duration. 
just like we talked about with, with bonds, right? You're expecting recession. You want higher quality, longer duration growth stocks because so much of their value is way out in the future. They tend to be longer duration. All right, we'll, we'll start there next time. Um, Garrett and Blake, hopefully I didn't lose y'all on shifting back and forth there. So, All right, I'll see y'all later. All right, let's get started. So next Tuesday, I wanna do the first paper I'll send out the instructions. So if you're you're in a team, so you only have to be here 30 minutes because it's kind of nice. So you're here 30 minutes. I got to do it for like three hours. But um, and also have the society classes. So I'm going to have to kind of figure that out and see how I work that out. So it's it's possible one team. You know, we'll see how we do it between. It may be Tuesday, maybe Thursday. I'll have to see how it works out. Um, I'll do them in the FSC. Um, because I don't want it to break and come up here, have to reset up, and that's gonna take five, 10 minutes. So I'll just do them in FSC. So just show up in FSC, RB on the Zoom. If you're on the Zoom, you'd be counted for attendance, but you have to be ready to talk about your paper, all right? So we're actually gonna look at your papers and talk about them. So it's part of me to make sure you're not procrastinating. I know there's at least two students that haven't even started, which is, this, this stresses me. Um, I, I've never figured out the advantage of procrastination, I don't know. I think some students think, you know, I, I could die in a car crash next week and I wouldn't waste it all the time on that paper at the end of my life. But the chance of that is really, really low. So procrastination doesn't help you in college. It definitely doesn't help you in, in business. So get ahead of the curve. Make sure you have a really good draft this weekend. Um, all right, so what we want to do today, finish up uh, stocks. Oh, I left that first part out. We're not going to do an overview of stocks. So we're going to finish up the bucks. And then talk about alternatives, and then we'll talk about that exam one, question one, which is what we've been doing. We'll finish up that question now. We might get into tactical allocation. Who knows? I always, I love talking about this stuff, so I always get off on tangents. But all right, so we talked about style. So, what are interest rates doing today? Do they rise today or are they falling today? The 10-year treasury. Anybody look? You never not want to know what the 10-year treasury is doing. Although I have some days where I don't be since I've retired, but when I wasn't retired, I always knew where the 10-year treasury was. Anybody want to look it up real quick? Seven base points. Was that a big day or a small day? Seven bips? It's a pretty big day. That's a one standard deviation event. So bonds are selling off today. What are stocks doing? Uh, pretty strong today, right? More than 1%, so that's a big day. So what would you think would be doing better today, growth stocks or value stocks? Interest rates shot up. Yeah, value stocks would do better, and they are doing slightly better. Interest rates is not a absolute predictable thing with stocks, but it's a more general thing. But the way I think about it, I think of growth stocks as being higher quality and longer duration. Now, don't think of them as quality. If you're expecting a recession, don't stick all your money in growth stocks. They're not going to be like treasuries, but they'll tend to out, they'll outperform value stocks. So they may be down 20% when value stocks are down 30%. So it's not low risk. So don't, don't think high quality means that it's, it's low risk. They're, they're risky. But if you go into recession, interest rates fall, they're going to act more like a high quality, long duration than, than value stocks. Value stocks do better when the economy is strong and when interest rates are rising. Um, and that's just general. It's not something you can bet on. Um, so growth stocks, we call them growth stocks because there's an assumption that these stocks are expensive because they're high growth. If you can find a stock that's expensive that's not high growth, it's probably overvalued. So, you know, that's somewhat what we think. Is it possible for a stock to be expensive but not high growth for some other reason? Yeah, who knows? Maybe someone's going to buy them out or whoever knows what other reasons. But that's what we call them. But we don't call value stocks slow growth stocks. So how do we come up with growth and value? Well, we got to name mutual funds. You don't want to name your mutual fund expensive stocks. You want to call them growth stocks, right? You don't want to name your mutual fund low quality stocks. You're going to call them value. So the two terms really are set for marketing. Um, 
So growth stocks do better in weaker economies. Why? Because they're higher quality. So again, don't associate the word quality with value. Value stocks are low quality. Growth stocks are high quality. Now, if you want to get into quality more, there's a firm called GMO. If you go to their website, they look at two things. They look at momentum and they look at um, quality. So they actually have on their website what's cheaper right now. So they've been a long time been saying quality should be more expensive. But they've gone times where say, wow, this is the cheapest quality has ever been. You should be buying quality, you know, right? If you have a company that's high quality, they're low debt, stable earnings, good growth, they should be more expensive than other companies. And they're, they look at that over time and say, wow, quality stocks look really, really cheap right now. I don't know if they're saying that today, but they have been saying that quite some time. But GMO, Jeremy Grantham, you may have heard of him in the news. All right, so if you look at it, what's outperformed recently? Well, it's pretty obvious, it's growth stocks. It's the, the Apples and the Amazons and Alphabets and Facebooks. Uh, Tesla's probably, probably classified as a growth stock. Now, once a growth stock, not always a growth stock. There were several years ago where people were buying Apple as a value stock because it got so cheap. How did they do with that trade, do you think? Well, it did really, really well. Um, so it can kind of go back and forth. Um, I don't know, it's hard for me to think of a value stock that became a growth stock. That's a little, little tough. Maybe, I mean, GameStop right now, GameStop is a value stock. It's a low quality, slow growth firm that's trading extremely expensively, but that has nothing to do with finance. <laughs> I don't know what, what MEM stocks even means, but you know, who knows why GameStop is trading so expensively. It's a stock that's worth maybe 25 bucks trading for, you know, $150, $250. So we're seeing some strange things going on right now, but, but growth stocks, huh? Don't they have a negative? Well, probably so because it's wrote so much. So beta is a statistical number, but you have so many outliers, it's probably been distorted. I haven't looked to see, but it, it definitely could be just because it's the stock prices move so much. But it's definitely a high beta company because of what it's selling. But yeah, the actual math itself is probably distorted. Um, all right, so what would you want to do today? I'm moving more into value stocks right now, which probably means you should avoid them like the plague. Because you know I'm going to be wrong, but that's what I'm slowly moving into them because I just think they've underperformed for so long. Now, there's books out there. There's one called The New Finance by uh, Robert Hagen. His whole book is about why you should buy value stocks and why they're going to outperform forever. Obviously, <laughs> he was wrong, but he argued value stocks are the place to be because of the way our industry is paid. He said, we're paid in such a way that growth stocks always get overpriced and always aren't going to perform. Um, he wrote that book and he started a value mutual fund and then growth stocks took off. So really bad timing. If you look over the long, long, long term, value stocks tend to have higher return with lower risk, which shouldn't exist, right? In finance, higher risk things should have higher returns. But long, long, long term, value stocks have had higher returns with less risk. So the question is, you know, the two questions in finance that are really dangerous are two statements. One is it's different this time. And the other one is it's not different this time. So those are the two most dangerous. So is it different this time? Is there something about growth stocks that they're gonna to continue to just keep going? And why do people say, well, value stocks are what? It's Sears, it's JC Penney, it's old economy, uh, it's retail box stores, it's gas companies, gasoline. We're not gonna be driving gas cars in 20 years. Valero's gonna go out of business. Exxon's gonna go out of business. That's the argument, growth stocks, everything's gonna be digital, everything's gonna be computers, someone I remember listening to a blog and the guy said, every successful com company going forward will be a software company. HEB, USAA, Walmart, Exxon, going forward, all successful companies will be software companies. So you see, essentially he's just saying, everything's going to be online. I can see that with USAA and HEB. You're going to do everything on your phone or digital. Um, but is, is that true? Are there some industries that that's not as important? Um, so have things really changed? 
I do think today versus when I when I graduated from college, it really didn't matter what industry you worked in. You just went and got a job. Today, I think you really do have to think a lot about what industry you want to be in. Uh, I think Valero is a right company. It's very well managed, really good employees, a lot of smart people. But what happens if, and I do think electronic vehicles are going to take over the world. What happens to Valero if everybody's doing electric vehicles? Well, they're diversifying, right? They're doing other things, try to get around that. But if that's, is that going to be enough? They got a lot of money invested in refinery assets, right? That's a big part of their balance sheet. So can they survive? Can Exxon survive in an electronic vehicle world? What if we go to um, autonomous vehicles? That's kind of my thought is, you know, 20 years from now, no one owns a car. You just click on your iPhone and a driverless car shows up. You get in it, takes you wherever you want to go. You get there faster, but you don't even care because you're on the cloud the whole time. Um, what is USA going to do if no one buys cars anymore? That's probably 70% of their profitability, including the bank, you know, makes bank loans for cars. They insure cars. Um, so that's, I think today you've got to think about those kind of things. Why? Where is your industry going to be? And I didn't have to worry about that. We didn't have an entire industries going under when I was graduating from college, but that's the thing now. So don't ask me the answer because I'm not a futurist. I don't know how to see those things. But um, so, so that's the one argument. The world is changing. The other side is everything I just said was the exact same thing people were saying in 2000. And what happened in 2000? Growth stocks dropped 80 something percent. So. Was it, were they right in 8,000 and 2,000 and say, hey, the world's different now. These growth stocks are not expensive. They don't have any earnings, but they're gonna take over the world. They were, they were wrong there. Some people say they weren't wrong in 2000. They were just 10 years too early. So who knows? So you've got to figure that out. Uh, I don't know what firms you're interviewing with, but that's something you'd want to think about because that's a pretty important move. The industry you start with is gonna really define your whole career. Uh, because you've got to you got to learn that industry, and learning the industry is the hardest thing you do in finance. Uh, industries are really complicated. You know, Valero is a very complicated firm. USA is a very complicated firm. You spend two years learning that, and they go out of business. It's like that industry knowledge. You know, that's a big part of your competitive advantage. So I, I do think it's important today. Um, all right, any question about growth and style? It's a it's not one, if some people don't like growth versus style, they, they kind of kick it out. Other people think it's really critical. Uh, but if you go in the uh, Morningstar, they definitely break up capitalization and style. That's a big part of what they do. It's, it, is, it is pretty well accepted by a lot of people. All right, so let's get to this last one with stocks, the U of bucks, US versus non-US. Remember when we talked about bonds, we said, you know, we're probably not going to have that as an asset class. We'll put it on the alternatives. Why? What do we say about bonds? What's the problem there? Bonds are dangerous as an asset class for non-US. Anybody remember? Because of currencies. Because currencies so dominate. That if you buy a bond bond that's non-US, the bond bond might be really safe might be good German bonds or UK bonds, but you're going to see a lot of volatility because of the currency. That is not true with stocks. Stocks are more volatile than currencies and the currency actually helps mitigate some of that risk. It kind of offsets it like a hedging. So you don't notice it nearly as much. Most stock investors outside of that buy stocks outside the US don't hedge the currency. So if they're buying Japanese stocks, they're buying two things. They're buying Japanese stocks and what else are they buying? They're long the yen, right? So they're buying Japanese stocks and the yen. Is it possible Japanese stocks go up and the yen crashes? Yeah, that's possible, that can happen. Um, but generally, they, they, there's somewhat relationship there, but it gives you some diversification. There are investors, um, if you're interested in currency, I mean, currencies could be your entire career, uh, look up on Google, Google the phrase currency overlay and just look what that means, what a currency overlay is. You go out and you buy stocks where you think you want to buy them. So I'm going to buy Japanese stocks, German stocks, uh, Brazilian stocks. That's the things I want. And then you hire another manager 
and you tell them, hey, here's what we're doing. We want you to go out there and trade currencies. So we buy Japanese stocks or 20% Japanese stocks and your currency manager says, yeah, but we don't like the yen. So you got Japanese stocks. They're then, then gonna sort the yen and buy the Euro. And so that's an overlay manager is they just manage your currency exposure. So some people do that. At USA, we never had currency. So if we bought Japanese stocks for both Japanese stocks and, and the yen in one trade. Um, so how do we break up US versus non-US? This is definitely an asset class. Probably in 1975, it was an alternative, but today this is, everybody does this. Everybody buys non-US stocks. So we have US stocks. That's what we just talked about, beta capitalization and style. Then we have developed market stocks. These are larger, more stable, more developed countries. They tend to have the same expected return and risk as US stocks, but you get some diversification because of their currencies and their economies. The next one, um, you can call it developing markets or emerging markets. What are you most commonly hear these? Yeah. Emerging. So emerging market. Why, why is it emerging market and not developing? It probably, again, marketing. It just sounds better. Now, emerging market stocks in the mid 80s and late 80s probably was an alternative asset class. They become much more mainstream now and people tend to do these type of securities. I remember the guy, Travis at USA that did this fund. Um, I don't know where he grew up, but uh, on the phone, he was, I don't know how many different languages he spoke, but uh, boy, it was amazing hearing him. He'd be talking to me in English and he could take this to phone. He's talking in Japanese or Mandarin. And it's like, wow, work. How many languages is this guy? No, so pretty impressive. Um, uh -huh. Like when you get into like emerging market stocks and frontier market stocks, would you start to see more currency overlays? Um, it, you stocks? might be surprised. Um, there are a lot of these countries that are so pegged to the dollar, you almost don't need to. I mean, that's just the way they are. I, I go a lot to Costa Rica, and they keep their currency pretty close where the US dollar is. So there isn't that much fluctuation. Um, if you're like in China and some other countries where they have a big currency, that does matter, it, it, it can. But um, sometimes in these countries, you it's tough. I, I don't even know how you would hedge like Costa Rican, the colonial, I don't know how you even hedge that. I don't think there's a market for that, that security other than just buying the actual, the actual security. So I don't think many people do hedge. And Remember the currency, the more volatile the stock is, the less the currency plays. And emerging markets are a lot more volatile. So the currency has less of a hit. Um, so emerging countries, developing countries, these are fast growing company countries. They're developing. They do have higher expected return, but definitely much higher risk. Uh, they're not as diversifying they used to be in the past just because of globalization and you have to really, you know, I say emerging, I would, I would actually break these, these countries up. I would, I would take the resource focused countries, those that are heavy in energy and steel and those that are producing stuff out of the ground, separate from the kind of the retail side, the Philippines, Vietnam, China that are producing stuff, textile, uh, they're very different economies. So there are certain emerging countries that are very closely tied to oil prices and steel prices and iron prices and those kind of things. Um, so you have to really, really be careful what your exposure is. They do provide diversification. Some of the diversification is fairly interesting. They're, they're really good diversifying to US bonds. Maybe to uh, Mitchell, to your point, is there's, there probably is some relationship there between interest rates and how they react to the US economy and the US dollar uh, that gives them some diversification benefit, but they're definitely highly correlated to US developing, developed and emerging countries. Frontier markets, so you, you, you don't wanna buy a plane ticket to uh, Las Vegas, but you still wanna gamble. That's where you can do it. Very dangerous markets. Now, some of you can't, I don't think you can really invest in Venezuela right now. I don't know what you would buy, what their stock market's like. 
if you have a tough time buying Cuban stocks right now, wouldn't it be kind of tough? So, you know, what, what are these frontier markets? Um, what, you know, Iran, Iraq, um, some of the African countries that have had some, uh, some political risk, um, you know, these are dangerous countries, but at the same time, if it works out, they have a good transition of leadership, get a good leader to come in, something like that. I mean, these are countries that have been struggling so much that any hope whatsoever can, you know, these are markets that can go up 200, 300% because it's so negative and then something good happens. It's, it, they don't go up 20%, they go up a massive amounts. I've never been a frontier market investor, mainly because this is a market where you specialize, you just know that market extremely well. So if you have family members in some of these markets or you have backgrounds in these markets, if you're willing to move and live in one of these markets, you can definitely make a career for yourself unless you know they go complete communist and buy everything and there's no more private market. You know, you could waste all your time learning a market and then the whole thing just crashes like a Venezuela or something. So it can be dangerous, but there's definitely firms that do these type of markets. Um, so how do you separate them? This is the way Standard & Poor's does it. These are the things they're looking at. You have to have a capitalization of greater than 2.5 billion. Now, what is Apple worth? Not 2 billion, what is it? 2 point something trillion. So we have one stock that's a thousand times larger than the minimum. So that's not a very, that's not a very difficult criteria. Turnover has to be more than a billion. I don't know what the turnover in the U.S. is, but the turnover just on Apple stock is probably more than a billion dollars on a daily basis. It's just how much gets traded every day. Exchange development ratio greater than five percent. You have to look that one up. Um, other criteria. So, if you're really going to be there, you got to be fifteen billion to get an emerging market. T plus three. When I traded at USA, we, we could do T plus zero. So T plus three is you buy the stock today and you got to send them the money three days later. So my, my trade desk, we'd say, well, you want to do T plus zero? I'd say, well, I don't really care. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's like big deal. Uh, sovereign debt, double B plus or above. Double B is a, not the greatest rating in the world because where does junk start? Y'all remember? Junk starts at double B plus, right? So that's just at the top of the junk. No occurrence of hyperinflation. What is hyperinflation? You have Venezuela right now or Germany or you have Zimbabwe or you have people going with $10 million to the grocery store. And by the time they get there, it's worthless. <laughs> it's like you should about 80 million. I only want, you know, some bread. I was like, yeah, bread was 10 million three minutes ago, but it's 80 million now. I mean, it's just like gets out completely out of out of whack. No significant foreign ownership restrictions, where some companies, countries definitely have that. Freely traded foreign currency. There's some debate on, on China and some other countries if that's really true. And GDP per capita greater than 15,000. Now I don't know where China is now, but they're getting close. I know they're over 10, so they're getting in that ballpark of hitting that. I, I spoke, I had, um, there's a group of mid-management people from China that came here for a class. Um, they were mid-management, they weren't top management. And so I was talking and said, well, how many people do you manage in your middle management? And they were like managing 10,000 people. It's like, okay, that's middle management in China is 10,000 people. Uh, I was upper management and managed like 20 people. So yeah, I mean, that's 10,000 people. Um, but I showed them this chart and it's like, you know, if China wants to become a developed market, here's why S&P says it's important. I, they, you might disagree with S&P's list, but let's show you what S&P con considers a firm that is, I mean, a country that's no longer developing, but it's now developed. Uh, and those are things I look at. And I think the GDP 15,000, obviously that's gonna change over time. Um, that kicks out a lot of countries. Uh, I mean, can you, could you live on 15,000 a year? In the United States, if you're living maybe with at home with the parents, maybe, all right, but that's that's not that much money. So uh, where I go in Costa Rica, the per cap, the wealthy people where I go is 5,000 market per cap. 
uh, per household, 5,000, they get about 5,000, they're considered fairly wealthy. So, you know, we're, we're kind of, you can definitely see the difference between these countries, but that's what s is looking at. Um, if we, let's see if I can get a list to come up. I should have found this before I did this. What country is s and I don't get that question. So there's the list right there. So countries under review, Iceland, what do you think their review is? Moving from what to what? Emerging developing, maybe so, Argentina, maybe emerging to frontier, who knows? Um, Iceland was removed following imposition of capital controls, is seeking the market feedback on particularly classify Iceland as a, as a frontier market, wow. Wow, what's going on in Iceland? I'm, I'm with you, Avi. It sounds like that'd be a pretty stable firm country, but um, I, I should have looked at the date on this thing, so who knows what I'm looking at. Um, SMA composition SP Frontier. So Argentina, Vietnam, Morocco, Nigeria, Panama, Romania, Kenya, Bahrain, Bangladesh. Is there anything on this list? You say, you know what? I think that country is going to turn around. It's going to make it. Is there any of these countries you would want to go live in and just learn them backwards and forwards so you would be an expert? Uh, I've always heard about Botswana. That would that might be one I might want to try out. I'm not sure what language, they, if they speak English there uh, very regularly or not, but that'd be a cool country to live in, right? And it's done fairly well versus some of the others. Zimbabwe, maybe not. Yeah, some of these European, East, former Eastern European countries are coming out. Cyprus sounds pretty exciting. Um, but Argentina looks like it's dominating the frontier index. Um, so what's going on with Argentina? You know, you've got some political issues, at least some inflationary issues, those type of things. Is Venezuela on this list? So are there countries that are, are not even frontier markets? So yeah, Cuba, Venezuela, there's North Korea. Where's North Korea in this list? How many of you are buying North Korean stocks? Probably not too much. So even there's even countries that don't even make the frontier market. Um, so Argentina's frontier. Um, so that makes, makes sense. Yeah, definitely been in the news. I mean, this is fairly recent stuff. All right, I wanted to find the developed markets and the emerging. Um, so Czech Republic, upgrade to develop. Hungary, upgrade to develop. That's interesting. Poland. I mean, these are firms, countries that definitely are making the news for political reasons, but that's not what s and is looking at. This isn't a political decision. So you look at that list of what they have. Uh, Vietnam, upgrade to emerging. Uh, Sir, when, so on these markets, like in India, when it says the S and P BSE, is that just their name, or does the S and P recognize them versus like um, Costax? What what are you saying? Like the name of their their markets, like Costax for Korea. Yeah, and I don't, I boy, you know, you know the general markets, you know the big developing ones. Um, yeah. I would assume s and is using their official name of their market, I would assume. But I can't tell you the, the symbols, the letters for these markets, because I don't. When I was at USA, the guy who worked for me, um, he was the international stock guy. He grew up in Pakistan. He had a lot of international exposure. And so, like, he was the international guy. I was the U.S. guy. So I kind of missed out on that, some of those discussions. So I just don't know. He would know those markets and all their symbols a lot better. Um, I mean, Vietnam's been interesting, right? I mean, this is a country we went to war with, but now it's actually, you know, very heavy in, in the textile business and uh, Bangladesh. What does standalone mean? Downgrade the standalone. That's interesting. Yeah, that's kind of a nice way of saying you don't, you're not anywhere. <laughs> Turkey, why are they downgrading Turkey? Obviously, a lot of political issues there, a lot of economic issues, some inflationary um, so yeah, if you get into the international side, 
what's the chance that you're going to learn every one of those countries? That's that's almost impossible, isn't it? And every one of them is very different. Um, so maybe it's a region. Maybe you're going to learn Africa, or maybe you're going to learn Asia or the Middle East. You know, how are you going to how are you going to handle this? Um, so I I would be tempted today if I had more guts and I were just leaving college. I would think, you know what? I'm going to move to Botswana. I'm going to learn their currency, their culture, their language. That's going to be my input into Africa. I don't know if living in Botswana is going to teach me the whole continent or not, but I'm going to become an expert on that. And as that market develops, you know, I'm going to, that's, that's where I'm going to have my expertise. I think that'd be pretty, pretty cool. I don't know if my family would want me to move overseas. All right. So here it is. Australia, Austria, Belgium, any country in here doesn't in Hong Kong. Can Hong Kong be a separate country than, than China? Then it could. Huh? Then it could. Yeah, well, this is the 2020, right? So they're, they're still showing them. Yeah, it's definitely definitely President Xi's making it, making it really clear what he would do with Taiwan if he ever got it. Japan's still a big part of the index. Now, Japan used to be like 50% of this index. So they used to be massive, and then they had their big stock market blow up. Luxembourg, that would be a great place to live, right? Singapore, not even a country, just a big city. South Korea, Spain, Switzerland, and then the U.S. So I, Japan wasn't 50% of this, but Japan was 50% of this if you took the U.S. out. Uh, the U.K. is a big player there. Emerging, China is the biggest emerging. India is pretty huge. Taiwan, any other stand out there? Brazil, y'all remember the BRICS? Anybody remember the BRICS? What's in the BRICS? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They used to put an S on the end for South Africa. I don't know why they did that. I mean, how's South Africa doing today? Any of y'all investing in South Africa? Really in bad shape, right? I was a little bit interested in them because um, when Zumo did, went down and the new guy came in, I can never remember how to say his name, but you have this reformer, you have this guy who looks like he's going to clean things up. You know, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of what you want, right? A new president comes in, he's got a reputation for, for being reforming and cleaning things up. So, you know, it's interesting, but then they just have, and South Africa is very much, you know, commodities, gold those type of thing and that those are the industries that are imploding right now because of the strikes uh, man vietnam is a huge part of that index um i don't even know what that is i mean all that country how do you even say that what is that country anybody lived there before you think that's ivory coast yeah just in another in french or something yes yeah, so morocco so look at Morocco. You think of Morocco as being a fairly small country, but it's 8%, almost 8.5% the emerging market index. Why is that? So this isn't the size of the country. It's not the size of the economy. It's the size of the stock market. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. So, I mean, here's one career move. As you find one of these countries, you just say, hey, I'm 20, 21 years old, 22 years old. I'm just going to go there, learn everything I can feet on the ground, then I'll come back to the US five years later, apply to an emerging market portfolio manager, and I'll be their African uh, analyst. Yeah, I think I think it would work. It'd be an interesting life, wouldn't it? It'd be pretty cool. Um, all right, and they have other indices that they, and, and they even have, I mean, the interesting thing is uh, a lot of the development a lot of the developed market indices don't have Canada. So there's one called EFA. Have you ever heard of EFA? So the EFA is a developed market index, but it, it lays out North America. North America is the US and Canada. And so you'll see indices that say EFA plus Canada. And they have to throw Canada in there because Canada is a pretty big economy. Um, so you have to be careful when you look at these indices. Some of them are a little bizarre. And what they leave in or leave out, but, but anyway, and there's you can see the level of expertise you can get. That's your question: is what are you going to specialize in? 
If you're not thinking that way as a finance person, start thinking like that. Your goal is to figure out what am I going to know that 99.99999% of the world doesn't know. And I'm going to know it better than anybody. And you're just going to deep dive on something. You just got to pick it. My guess is you won't pick it. Instead, it's going to pick you. You're going to apply to 20 jobs and one of them is going to, going to give you that kind of excitement. So, all right. So how are these markets done? Well, here's the sad part of it. Where's the only place you wanted to be in the last 20 years? Just in the US. So Jack Bogle, the guy who started Vanguard, he recommended 0% allocation to developed and emerging markets. And he got a lot of heat for that. Um, it looks like he was right. His argument was these markets can't get their act together. Europe is always a mess. Um, there's always political turmoil. If you want to be international, buy Exxon, buy Coca-Cola. There's a lot of international, you know, global companies in the United States. But he's very, he was way off the charts from what you're taught in school and what most people believe. Most people say, hey, you need diversification. But what is that diversification done for you here? That's a pretty heavy cost just to reduce your volatility a little bit. And if the US market crashes, what are these markets going to do? They're going to crash too, right? So you might say, well, the US crashed more, but if you look at it as percentage change, the US, you know, really not quite as much. So, so anyway, um, if you go a long, long, long way back in the past, it's it's the same, same answer. And which of these should be the highest based on financial theory? Which of those three is the riskiest? Emerging. Emerging, Emerging should be way on top. U.S. should be at the bottom. And right now it's, it's flipped. I'm not saying put all your money in U.S. stocks, but there are people like Jack Bogle that are highly, highly respected who actually argue uh, don't buy anything but U.S. stocks. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I worry a lot about Europe. It, there's a lot of negatives there. It's a dying population. It's, its regulations are quite horrible. The UK just left the European Union and the UK was the most innovative and progressive of those countries. That's kind of the that, that downside of UK leaving. I don't know. I think you can make an argument that, you know, can we ever expect them to do anything that's going to get them growth? But who knows? If I were doing emerging countries are developed, I think I would do my homework and find one that really excited me and just go for it. <laughs> See if I can't find one country that's really gonna turn around. And remember what we talked about earlier, growth comes from productivity. So what are you looking for? You're looking for the country, not that it has the best productivity, but what, what are we looking for? Huh? Young populations for why? Because you can get the biggest change in productivity. So where does that come from? Innovation, education, the age of the, pop, the population, those are kind of things. So what countries have, like, that's why I say Africa, people keep saying Africa is gonna have their century because of the youth of their, of, of their workforce, the commodity rich, uh, but we'll see, you know, there's a lot of political pressures keeping that from happening. Now, some people say, well, throw the, all of that out and just everything's global. So instead of having US large cap and developed market stocks, just do global large cap, do global mid cap, global small cap, do global growth, global value. So there's no reason I, to do US versus the world versus the world, just go global. Now, obviously Jack Bogle wouldn't like that because I give you a really heavy allocation to non-US stocks. And I say focus on capitalization. You could focus on capitalization and style. So you could do global large cap value stocks, global large cap growth stocks. So you could do everything I did on the BCS, but just make it global. So the, what's the difference between global? So there's three terms. There's US stocks international stocks, global stocks. Any guesses? You know what, US stocks, what's the difference between international stocks and global stocks? 
Any takers on that? Nationals from a single country that's not the U.S. and global. That's all. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. The international doesn't include the U.S. I don't know. You said something about a single or, country. Yeah, like it's a specific country and global is spreading like Coca-Cola. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll keep saying okay, that's not the way. I mean, that would be logical, but that's not the, what they mean here. So when you see international, it means all countries except what? Except the U.S. So when you see international, that means U.S. is not in there. So what do you think global means? Yeah, all countries. So if you're in an interview and they use the word international, you know, so we buy international stocks, they're saying buy nine US stocks. They probably won't say, so we buy global stocks because that's every stock. But um, So if you're gonna be a global investor, you're gonna say, you know what? I don't care that I live in the United States. The world is my stock market any stock from any country, I'm not gonna make that distinction between US and non-US, that would be global. If you go to Vanguard, they have international stock funds and they have global stock funds. And just with that title, you'll exactly know what they mean. International, okay, there's no US stocks in there. Global, there's gonna be US stocks in that. Okay, so I don't know who came up with these terms, but that's the way you use. So yeah, what you said column is perfectly logical sense, but that's not the way they, they do it. So there is some nomenclature you gotta, you know, get used to that they don't, we don't really talk much undergraduate, but boy, when you get out there and interview, they just assume you know these things. Now, some other people are saying, well, sometimes you should be global, but sometimes you shouldn't. There's some industries like energy that are absolutely global. I mean, what's the difference between Shell and British Petroleum and Exxon and Chevron, I mean, they're, they're just global energy companies. So when I look at energy, I'm not gonna make a distinction in country. I'm just gonna look at the com at companies and make my decision. But then there's other sectors that are very local, like rec restaurants or some retail. There, I'm gonna definitely look, okay, I got my US restaurants, I got my non-US restaurants. There, I'm gonna make a distinction. So are some combination, remember the word par parsimonious. So you wanna do it in a way such that you don't have 500 things that you're looking at. And you also make sure you do it in a way that actually tells you something, that you're actually explaining risks and you're not leaving something out or have too many things going on. Um, so what I showed you before, which is US and international, that's the traditional approach. That still is the most traditional approach, but there are some people starting to say, hey, maybe there's a better way of breaking these up. Um, now, if you want to study more about this, um, you, know, you really have to get into the details. Uh, there's a great index. It's called the Ease of Doing Business Index. Let's see if I can find it here. Not sure that's the right one or not. I'm always nervous what I'll bring up, but I don't think that would have been a negative bad one. All right. So ease of doing doing business. Now, what are you looking for? New Zealand's number one. So does that mean put all your money in New Zealand? Well, if we know New Zealand's a great place to do business, the stock market probably already reflects that. So that's going to help you. So if you want to make a great investment uh, return, what are you looking for? You're gonna probably do this, right? And you're looking for the country that's gonna do what? Go from 96 to 65. <laughs> so who is that? The Philippines. I was just listening to a podcast. There's people in the Philippines that are making $60 a day doing these NFT gaming things. I have no idea what any of that means, but that's pretty impressive, 60 bucks a day. That's a lot of money in an emerging country. Um, they must have good internet connection or they wouldn't be doing all that stuff. Is Guatemala gonna turn around? Who's at the bottom, any guesses? Where's the worst place to start a new business in the world? North Korea. North Korea, I don't even know if they even rank them. Somalia, Eritrea, Venezuela, Yemen. I don't know why Liechtenstein got. South Sudan, 
or some of these countries you just wouldn't want to be. I mean, they're in the middle of civil wars or whatever, you know. So, um, are any of these countries turning around positive? And I remember listening to a podcast, a guy who said Iraq. He was doing, I think I told you that before. He was finding mid sized small companies in Iraq. He said, hey, the news in the US is so negative. These businesses are actually working and doing well. Now, the other thing you can look at is what are they actually what are they actually grade? And that might be interesting to you. Why does New Zealand do so well? So they rank number one on starting a new business. That's pretty cool. That'd be good, right? I mean, if it it's it takes you a week to start a new business versus three years. Dealing with construction permits, getting electricity, they don't do so well there. Registering property. That's something I think we could do a whole lot better in the United States, but we've got some bad, bad incentives. Um, getting credit. They're number one there. Protecting minor, minority investors, right? You don't want them ripping you off if you're an investor there. Um, paying taxes, trading across borders. They don't do as well there, probably because they're an island. Um, that's the last two. Enforcing contracts. Resolving insolvencies. That's something I know that's been a big deal in some countries where uh, you go bankrupt and you can never shut down. And you're just this business. In the US, it's pretty easy to go bankrupt and you just you go bank. And it's no shame. You just start a business again somewhere else. That's pretty powerful. I don't know how the US ranks on resolving insolvency, whereas the United States, we rank number two. I don't know who's ahead of us, but that's that's pretty good. Um, now, there's obviously some subjectivity to this. So I know a few years ago, Putin said, we're moving up on this list. Putin didn't said, did not say, we're going to get better at doing, allowing people to do business with ease. That's not what he said. He said, we're moving up on the list. So he looked at these categories and said, what can we do artificially so we go up on the list? That's not what you want, right? That's not your goal is to just move up because you, you did so. I don't know where Russia is here. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe it'll just take them over. Where is Russia? Go find Russia. Yeah, you want to go to it. Let's see if it will sort it by economy. All right, so let's look at the R's. So I don't know how he's done. 28, I mean, that ranks really, really high. Do you think of Russia as being one of the top 30 countries that do, how many of y'all want to go to Russia and start a new business? If you're successful, what happens? Putin arrests you, arrests you and you go to jail, yeah, and he takes over your business. I don't know why they have this little thing there, what that even means. I should I click on it. Yeah, I don't know, I probably shouldn't click on it. <laughs> Russian Federation. Um, but as you as an investor, you got to get away from the politics and the controversy. Your goal is, I want a country that's going to move up this list for doing real things. They're getting better, not from artificial things. Uh, I remember uh, in Costa Rica, our, our friends in Costa Rica, they came to the United States and I said, man, if I, I need to get you a USA checking account because then I can get your money to you a lot faster. So we go to USA at like 4.55. We walk in and we walk out at five o'clock with checkbooks and a checking account. And go, oh, that was, that was good. Well, I got that out of the way. And they're like, yeah, in Costa Rica, that takes several months. <laughs> so, okay, you're good. I'm glad we got that done for you. But they were just completely blown away. They said, yeah, you would never do this in Costa Rica. It's just impossible. And I don't know where Costa Rica ranks on any of this. I know it is horrible to do business in Costa Rica because we've started several businesses in Costa Rica. And it's just terrible. They're 74th. If I were president of Costa Rica, I would want to get up on the list by actually fixing things. I would sit down and say, what are they measuring here? Why do we rank so low on whatever that is? And I don't know what that one is, but why do we rank so low on that? starting a business and yeah that's absolutely true it takes forever and it's it's incentives right hire the government employees incentivize if a government employee makes forty thousand dollars if they get five businesses started and they make forty thousand dollars if they get two businesses started how hard are they going to work they don't care 
It's like, yeah, I, I have no incentive to help you get your business started. I make the same amount of money. So yeah. But if you incentivize people to do a better job, uh, yeah, you know, it's, that's what you're after. So, so there's a lot here in finance. There's a massive amount here in finance that you really can specialize in and become an expert and really pay your, pay your way for the rest of your life very easily. Um, there's a few books I recommend. Jim Rogers, you might YouTube him. He's, um, I like old rich dudes and that who just don't care. <laughs> And so they speak their mind and they're, you know, they're grumpy and they're, but he knows what he's talking about, but he's also rich enough that he doesn't care what you think of what he says. And so he's, he's, he's very interesting to listen to. He's got been pretty controversial here of late. So uh, there's his book, Jim Rogers. This book's out a few years, so he's a little older than that. But um, his idea is Asia. Asia is where it's going to be. How much did he believe that? Well, he got married, had two daughters, moved to China so that they would grow up speaking Mandarin. He thought China was too polluted. He was in a city that had really bad pollution, so he moved to Singapore. That's how much he believed in that in the Asia story. So he, he puts his money where his mouth is. I thought it was a good book. It was an interesting book. It's not on my recommended read list, but it's a good book. I do recommend this one, Why Nations Fail. It's a long book and it's a long book, I think a little overkill. They have a theory and what they're trying to tell you is why do some firms, some countries, I keep saying firms, why do some countries do well and some countries fail? That's what you wanna know as an investor, right? What's the characteristics of countries that will do well? And they start out the few, first few chapters with their theory. And then the entire rest of the book, they're gonna prove their theory with just way too many examples. <laughs> So why did Rome in, empire do so well in 100 BC? You know, it's like, okay, that's a few too many examples, but they do go through many, many different centuries, many different countries. Why was Argentina one of the richest countries in the world in the early 1900s? And then a few decades later, they're, they're completely, you know, a basket type case. What is it about them that they could not sustain that? And so that's what you want as an investor is, yeah, what am I looking for? If you don't want to read that massively long book, then there's one, I don't know if you're aware of the great courses. There are essentially courses that you can buy. Um, so one of, one of my former students said, wow, this is a great professor. You should read this or get this course. So I got it. And I kept thinking, wow, I'm just, I'm listening to someone summarize why nations fail. And on about the third or fourth class, he, he admitted that he was, this book, that book was the basis for his entire class. So it kind of made sense then. So if you, if you don't want to do is reading a book, you'd rather go through a class. He does a good job of summarizing what they say in that. Um, and then I found this, um, this interview that I thought was really good. And it's a few years old, but I think it's still pretty good. Uh, so there's, there's those. Um, but this guy, Bushir Sharma, he has the four Ds that he talks about. This is what you need to look at when you're trying to figure out where you want to invest your money. Um, and the Ds are all negative. Um, D population. Japan, right? Shrinking population. D globalization. So his argument is there's so much anti-globalization. What countries are going to benefit if we do less trade and what companies will, will do poorly? So he's saying Europe is going to get crushed by deglobalization. <laughs> U.S. relatively will probably do pretty well. U.S. is one country that can do well. At global, not, he's not going to say we're better off with not global, but he's saying relative to the others, the U.S. will probably fare okay. Europe will be a disaster. You can read his deleveraging. There's so much debt, especially government debt out there. So which, which countries are just overladen with debt? Not just government debt, but even their corporate debt. And de-democratization. We're seeing... More and more countries with, I mean, you're, you're seeing it, Venezuela, Bolivia, uh, Peru is really worried right now, right? Any of y'all from Peru? Peru's got some political things. My Spanish teacher's from Peru and, oh, I ask her a question in Spanish about what's going on in pol politics. And then she talks for the next 45 minutes and I catch like three words, but I can tell she's not happy. <laughs> it's like, no, I don't like this guy. And boy, it's like, yeah, there's things going on in the world which 
make you worried about democratization, about globalization. So he does a good job, not just of saying what's going on, but gives you ideas as an investor, where do you want to invest? What should you be looking out for? So you could probably find his name. This is an interview, Barry Ritholtz. I forget what he does. It's a uh, oh, master's in business. I think that's his podcast. So you could probably find this one. It's five years old, but he, he has all of his all of his podcasts out there. Or uh, just search Barry Ritholtz in uh, YouTube and you'll probably find him. He's a well-known. He does have a book. I think I bought his book, The Rise and Fall of Nations, Forces of Change in, a, in the Post-Crisis World. What does he mean by post-crisis? He's probably talking about 2008. Now it's the post-crisis, post-crisis with COVID. So it's like the next crisis. Um, so this is what, you know, if you don't like reading, you're going to have to find some substitute because if you're a finance major, you're going to be reading a lot. But fortunately today, you can do podcasts and YouTubes and books. I do books on tapes because I do all my book reading on my bike, which is hard to do with a physical book. But um, I listen to them. Um, you just need to do a lot of that. Now, these are the kind of people I would be, be reading. People who say, this is what distinguishes who wins and who loses. What? That's what you are as an investor. Isn't that the most important thing you got to decide as an investor? So these are the kind of people I would be reading. Um, and he, he's a really good, he's a very interesting, that's the other thing. It's not some some kind of boring lecture. It's, it's a pretty interesting conversation. All right, so that's it for stocks. So bucks, what are, what are the bucks? Anybody off the top of your head? Beta, so what are the two things under beta? Cyclical and defensive. The next one, US versus non-US, what's the categories there? Well, not that category, but that is uh, emerging, frontier, and developed, and then the US, all right, what's next? Capitalization, categories there, large cap. Mid cap, small cap, micro cap, and penny stocks. And then what's the last one? Style, and you only have two there. Earth and value. All right, y'all got it. How much of that did you know two months ago? 5% of it, zero. All right, so you're already there. Um, it gives you powerful stuff to talk about, right? I mean, you can, you can give a really intelligent answer. In an interview, someone says, well, where would you be investing right now? I say, oh, man, I'm interest rates rise and the economy isn't going to recession. I think small cap value is going to be coming back. Boy, value should do well and rising interest rates as long as they don't have a recession. I mean, that doesn't sound like a college student, does it? That sounds like an investment professional. Why do you want to sound like in an interview, a college student or an investment professional? <laughs> How does a college student sound? They sound like a textbook. <laughs> How does a professional sound like? They sound, they, they use jargon, they say bips instead of basis points, right? Um, so try to sound like an investment professional. That's what we're trying to do in investment societies, kind of get that jargon out there so you kind of get used to it. All right, so there's stocks, a lot of career opportunities in bonds, a lot of career opportunities in bond and stocks. I mean, there's, it's exciting time. I, I'm kind of jealous of you. And it's nice being retired and my career's over. I don't have y'all stress of what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. But you're living a far more exciting time than I did. I was when I graduated. And boy, it's like, man, if I were graduating right now, the, the stress on me would be, man, there's too many options. <laughs> there's so many exciting things out there. What do I really want to sink in and, and specialize and become an expert on? Boy, it, it, it would be a tough decision right now. Okay. Alternatives is the last class that so we had cash, bonds, equity stocks, and then alternatives. So alternatives is everything else. Remember things move in and out of alternatives. Emerging stocks used to be an alternative and now it's back under, under stocks. Um, you Non-US debt used to, is, is still an alternative. It hasn't moved out for most people. So why do people buy alternative assets? And there's two reasons. The main reason is diversification. Those people who sell alternatives, they always talk about diversification. 
whether it's real estate or commodities, they say, hey, this is going to diversify the rest of your portfolio. And they have a lot of power behind that to support that. The other thing is one of the biggest alternatives is real assets. Real assets, if you're worried about inflation, they'll, they'll tend to hold up better inflation. Now, who knows with our real estate market so expensive right now, if that's really going to be the case. But real assets, especially gold, should hold up really, really well with inflation. All right, just a second. I don't trust the clock I have here. Yeah, it's 3.30, right? Mm -hmm. This clock says it's 3.10. I'm thinking, my word. I, I don't think it's that early. All right, so when we look at alternatives, we have real assets. And then we have the only other one I'm going to give you is uh, venture capital. So what else could be in there that I don't have? Well, we'll talk about some of them. Well, so real assets is the biggest one. Venture capital, so some people, venture capital or private equity is not an alternative. It's just under equity somewhere. But what else could be in there? We'll talk, should head funds be in there? Should Bitcoins be in there? Should derivatives be in there? So when you get to alternatives, this is where you're gonna find a lot more variety between different groups as far as uh, what should be in there and what should not be in there. So we we'll start with real assets. Now, what real assets do we have? Well, real estate, obviously. Timber, timber is one of my favorites. Timber is, is both real estate and a commodity. That's a wonderful thing. So we'll talk about timber. Commodities, obviously, that's a big one. And then one we're not going to spend much time, which is other real assets, artwork, coins, bitcoins, maybe collectibles. That's not my area of expertise. All right, so those are going to be our real assets, real estate, timber, commodities, and then just other. Now, any real estate finance majors in here? I think we have any in here. Yeah. So real estate, you know real estate. For our purposes, we're, we're mainly focused on commercial. We are focused on commercial real estate. So I'm not talking about you buying a house and renting it out or buying your own house. We're not talking about you know residential real estate. Uh, apartment complexes, that would be commercial real estate. Hotels, office, uh, industrial, build a suit. That's all commercial real estate. Um, what is the expected return of real estate? And the traditional view is that real estate returns somewhere between stocks and bonds and its risk is somewhere between stock and bonds. Now, why don't we know the answer to that? Why don't we just go out and get daily returns of real estate over the last 40 years or monthly returns of real estate compared to the stock market, compared to the bond market? Where do you get your daily real estate returns from? What index do you use? So let's say you buy a house and you want to create an Excel spreadsheet for the gain or loss on your house every day. How would you do that? It'd be really hard, wouldn't it? <laughs> what, where do you get the price of your house from? You go out to Zillow, how often does that change? Not too frequently. And how accurate is that? Now you could sell your house every day, right? That'd be one way to do it. How long does it take you to sell a house? Do that daily, you may not like the price. So that's the problem with real estate. We don't have daily prices. We really don't even have monthly prices. And really we don't even have quarterly prices, although that's the way it's usually reported. So when you see a real estate return, how much of it is actual transactions and how much of it is it an appraisal? And probably 80, 90% of it is, is an appraisal. It's someone's estimate. And so when you have an index on real estate and the bulk of that estimate is someone's appraisal, someone going in and say, I think this is what it's worth. What's that's going to do the real estate returns is going to make them look much smoother than stocks or bonds that do trade every day. And so real estate, it looks too good to be true. When you get the indices and you can get indices like from NACREF, NACREF has quarterly numbers. When you look at the numbers, Real estate has this wonderful return and almost no risk. I mean, it's just so stable, but we know that's not true. Now stocks, let's say you buy a stock 
it's going to trade every day. Someone's going to be selling that stock somewhere every single day. And not only that, every minute, right? You can calculate your return every minute if you want to on Apple stock. So, and how confident are you of that? That's pretty reliable information. So stocks, we know bonds, a little trickier. Treasury bonds, we can, we can figure those out every minute, but corporate bonds don't trade that frequently, but we can get a lot better idea of the true return of bonds and stocks, but real estate, it's a lot tougher. So there's something called appraisal smoothing, which means when you look at real estate indices, they look a lot less volatile than they probably really are because we don't have that true price every day. Now, if you, you buy a house, it has 10 rooms in it. If two of the rooms get sold every day, then that gives you a price. And you know what your rooms might be worth. That'd be nice, but that's kind of a strange transaction, right? You don't really know what that means. So, so that's the other issue with, with real estate. It's not fungible. So just because your neighbor sold their house, does that give you absolute confidence what your house is worth? They have a pool. You don't have a pool. You have four bedrooms. They have three bedrooms. You know, so even then you can't compare. So, um, so it's a little tricky. So we just assume stocks and bonds kind of are the bookends for real estate. Real estate's there in the, in the middle but we don't know that for absolute certainty. It's an extremely illiquid asset. Where you think about real estate is there's two ways to think about real estate. It's geography and property type. Geography is, are they in the US? If they're in the US, are they South, Southwest, North, Northeast, Northwest, and, um, kind of the mid country are international. So we tend to think about the location and then the property type is it hotel, office, retail, industrial, apartment, malls, hopefully not malls, uh, and several others. When I was at USA, our focus was a hotel, office, and industrial. Those were our main ones. And they did most of theirs was industrial. They, they made a lot of money on the industrial side um, and big hotels. Yeah, USA was really, really big, like Lock and Dara, right? Yep. Seeing that, that's, that was a big holding for USA. And um, Six Flags, <laughs> um, I probably shouldn't do this on screen, but y'all know what USA got when they sold Six Flags? What price they got? So when's the last time you sold something and you wrote a check? So I wanna sell my car to you, here's my car and here's, here's $10,000. How many of y'all have ever sold a car and you wrote a check for 10,000 to sell the car? That's what we did. <laughs> We sold Six Flags and we paid the buyer money. So we essentially paid off some of the debt. That's how bad that investment was. So I don't know how Six Flags is doing now. They're a pretty low rated company. It's a tough business. It's a tough business without, without a pandemic. It's a tougher business with a pandemic. So it's a tough business. Um, so USA's main focus was hotel and office, but really, really heavy in industrials. Um, Apartments would be part of a category. Residential housing would not be, all right? So if you buy if you buy houses, that's really not part, it's not gonna be part of any of these indices at all. Um, now, can we make real estate more liquid? This has been a big debate. Let's say, let's have this company buy all this real estate and we'll just stick it into a publicly traded company and then the stock market will tell us what that real estate's worth, right? So you got this company that owns 500 properties. It's a publicly traded company. Now we know what the market thinks of that every single day. Is that a way to solve it? And there's a couple of those companies. The one I wanna focus here on is on real estate investment trust, but there's also real estate operating companies. So REOX and REITs. Have you ever heard of REITs before? So a REIT, a REOC is just a real estate company, you know, it's just a publicly traded company that owns real estate. A REIT is a special type of REOC that has tax, tax advantages. So the IRS says REITs are not taxable. Um, if, you own a, if you own a REIT, it's tax-free. You as an investor have to pay tax, but the REIT itself is tax-free. But the IRS says, yeah, that's fine. As long as you distribute a lot of your income, you can be tax-free. So it's a, a nice tax advantage. And so 
does that do it? Can you, hey, you know what? I want to buy real estate, but I want to know what the daily price is. So I'm going to buy a REIT. Well, the problem with that is when you look at REITs, they look like small cap stocks. They act exactly like small cap stocks. And why is that? Because most REITs are small companies. They don't look like anything different than just another small cap. And why is that? As soon as you provide liquidity to an illiquid asset, you completely change its characteristics. Its risk goes up, its price discovery goes up. Um, and so, and I know firms that they buy REITs as their real estate investment. And what are they really doing? They're really loading up on a segment of the small cap. Uh, I had a mutual fund I had inherited. It's crazy fun. I had fixed it before I got it, but it was 25% stocks, 25% bonds, 25% gold, which is crazy, and 25% REITs. That thing just was, I mean, boy, like a roller coaster. It was just crazy, crazy, crazy. The 25% gold, especially, but the 25% REITs. But well, what was their argument? Well, gold's going to give us diversification and REITs give us the real estate. Well, the REITs didn't give them the real estate. It just gave them more stock exposure, but just really concentrated in one particular industry. So you really can't, you really can't overcome this illiquidity, illiquidity problem. Now we're going to talk about private equity. There are people trying to do the exact same thing with private equity. Let's put private equity into a traded security and then we'll get private equity. They're just going to do the same thing. It's not going to look like private equity. It's going to look like a stock. Um, this is what we call price discovery. When you make something really liquid, you get more frequent price discovery, but that price discovery is not really telling you about what's going on with the real estate. It's much more sensitive to what's going over on with the entire economy and getting a lot of noise that's going on. I give you a few websites here. So Nacreef is, is an interesting one. They've unfortunately have um, stopped providing free stuff. They used to have a lot of free stuff that you could get on their site. Hopefully I typed that right. So I, I love real estate sites because you get these wonderful, beautiful building pictures, right? That's what people love real estate. You get these wonderful you know, cities, skyscrapes. I don't know what city that is, but um, they do have data products. They used to have a real estate industry going back many, many decades on a quarterly basis that you could bring in for free. They now are not, unless they've changed it here recently, they're now no longer providing that for free. But there is some stuff out there. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. And then NARIT, is the real estate, again, a bunch of buildings. It's a real estate, but it's for REITs. Now, it's pretty hilarious when I was at USA, NAREIT hired Ibbotson to do a study of REITs to go prove people that REITs are now acting more like real estate and less like small cap. And they came in, they showed us the numbers and they're exactly right. I said, wow, you're right. REITs really have changed. They left. I said, well, I got to check that out on myself. So I brought in the numbers and they were exactly right. Up through the month that they did their analysis, we added the next few months and it completely disappeared. So for one little short period of time, REITs started acting very differently than everything else. And as soon as they finished the study, REITs went back to looking just like small cap. But they hired this firm to go around the country and say, hey, think about REITs again as real estate because they're, they're acting differently. And then it, it, it completely disappeared. Right, we'll, we'll start there. There's a little bit more we can do, obviously, with real estate. So 